So let's dive in on next gen climate action plans. Large universities can be said to function as mini cities of their own with responsibilities raising from master planning to energy procurement, waste management to safety and everything in between. With custom designed approaches that suit their institutions, Boston University, MIT and Harvard have all applied climate criteria to a sweeping set of strategic and operational actions that are reshaping their institutions internally and affecting the relationship with the world beyond the campus. This GRCX aims to connect the world, the work of the higher ed leaders to the goals and challenges of other schools and organizations across Boston and with the city itself. We have a stellar world leading lineup of institutional climate experts here in Boston. And three of them are joining us today. Dennis Carlberg from BU, Julie Newman from MIT and Heather Henriksen from Harvard. There are some very special aspects to this trio. First is the collaborative competitiveness, if you will, that helps drive excellence amongst them. Second, the way that each plan reflects the unique strengths, needs, and character of, the, of their institution. And third, the fact that each of these individuals has been with their school since climate stage zero. They are not only ambitious leaders, but the founders of the work you will hear about today. I also want to thank Dennis, Julie, and Heather and their teams for the incredible generosity in sharing their time and knowledge over the years with the GRC community. And I want to thank their institutional leaders who serve on the GRC itself, Katie Lapp, Executive Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer at Harvard, Bob Brown, President of Boston University, and Glenn Shore, Executive Vice President and Treasurer at MIT. So each Julie, Dennis, and Heather will share, uh, will present for about 10 minutes, and then we'll get straight into a moderated discussion and we'll be taking questions from you, the audience. And on that note, uh, we have a couple of very quick poll questions just to find out who's here because it is a pretty big crowd today. So Claire, if you can tee that up. First, what is your professional affiliation? Just answer that, higher ed, other institution or business, government, public sector. I think we're supposed to have an other choice there, but that's okay. And then second, where is your company or institution on climate action planning? Not started, early days still, pretty far along, or approved and currently implementing? We'll give five more seconds for that. Okay, Claire, what do we have? All right, let's see. Should be able to see the results. Fantastic. So we have a really good spread across different sectors and uh, industries here. A lot of higher ed, but a lot of other institutions probably very eager to hear uh, from the pace setters and some and a good representation from government and public se sector. And um, I am glad to see early days and pretty far along. Um, I'm not seeing that fourth choice. Maybe that doesn't, maybe there's a little poll glitch that doesn't show about how many people are actually implementing. But anyway, this gives us a good sense that we are not at the beginning here which is, I think, really different from where we would have been just a couple of years ago in Boston. Good, well, let me introduce our panelists then. Um, first, Dennis Carlberg is uh, Vice President, Associate Vice President for Sustainability at Boston University. He's an architect, lead AP, more than 26 years of experience. 25 years of experience. He joined BU as its first sustainability director in 2009. He's also faculty advisor for the Earth House, a living learning community at BU, previously a practicing architect with a longstanding interest in energy usage and sustainability. He also holds a number of roles in Greater Boston, including co-chair of the Climate Resilience Committee of the Urban Land Institute, sits on the Climate Ready Boston Infrastructure Advisory Group, um, and several other uh, city and commonwealth 
wide um, committees that are advancing our response to climate change. Julie Newman, PhD, Director of Sustainability at MIT, came to MIT in 2013 as the first Director of Sustainability for the Institute and was charged with launching the Office of Sustainability. She also holds a lecture appointment with the Department of Urban, Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. Previously, uh, Julie founded the Office of Sustainability at Yale University in 2004. Um, and also the Northeast Campus Sustainability Consortium, which is the longest standing active network of university sustainability professionals in the United States. Julie lectures and consults nationally, internationally, and um, is on the advisory board of the International Sustainable Campus Network, where she co-leads a city university partnership um, and I thought that was just an important thing to note when we get into how all of this applies to cities later. And finally, Heather Henriksen uh, joining us. Good morning, Heather, is um, Harvard University's Chief Sustainability Officer since 2008, advising the president and senior leadership on strategy and building an organizational change enterprise. She directs the Office for Sustainability, which oversees the implementation of Harvard's comprehensive sustainability plan and the ambitious new climate action plan. Heather is a nationally recognized leader in healthier building materials um, and has really put a health uh, emphasis on climate on Har Harvard's climate plan. Um, and she advises on courses throughout Harvard College and the professional graduate schools there. So uh, trust me, I've abbreviated these people and without further ado, I will turn it over to you uh, Dennis. Thank you, Amy. Let me see if I can get my, my um, slides. Can you see the slides? Okay, great. Um, so um, thanks, Amy. I, I uh, want to really start at the beginning here um, and talk about our progress as well as our process in developing the Climate Action Plan. But starting at the beginning, um, students and faculty at BU lobbied the university to divest from investments in uh, uh, the endowment uh, from fossil fuels. This led the university's advisory committee for socially responsible investing to hold public forums and develop recommendations during the 2015 and 16 academic year. In 2016, the board of directors approved several of their recommendations. Among them were to divest from direct investments in coal and tar sands, and they agreed to revisit that decision within five years. They also asked the university to develop a climate action plan for the university. They said it was time for the university to walk the walk. I thought we were already walking, to be frank, uh, but I'll get back to that. Uh, let me just say that the board uh, did revisit the divest ish, divestment issue this year and in September voted to divest from fossil fuels uh, starting immediately. President Brown charged the Climate Action Plan Task Force to address the university's research and education missions, operations, finance, and asked us to engage the community internally and externally throughout the process of developing a plan. We had an 18 member task force, which was faculty led and made up of faculty, staff and students. We organized ourselves into four working groups around energy, climate preparedness, transportation and mobility and supply chain and waste stream. We engaged our community in a wide range of conversations and knowledge exchange activities, including meetings with Julie and Heather and their teams uh, to discuss some of the more gnarly issues. Uh, in December 2017, the Board of Trustees approved the Climate Action Plan, and provided, which provided five high-level recommendations. First was to prepare our campuses for the impacts from climate change that can no longer be avoided, to get to net zero direct emissions for the university's operations by 2040, to act on indirect emissions, those emissions we compel by how we move, what we buy, and what we waste, and to integrate the climate uh, climate change and sustainability into the university's educational research missions and to integrate the climate action plan itself into the university's strategic plan. 
So let me walk you through how we're making progress on these fronts. This map is a map of Boston today showing flooding of, from a 100 year storm or flooding with a 1% chance probability of occurring in any given year. Uh, this is the same storm in 2070 caused by our changing climate. So to prepare for flood risk from sea level rise and storm surge, we established what we called an elevation of resilience above which all critical research, building systems, and equipment should be located to reduce their exposure to future flooding. This elevation of resilience is set at two feet above the top of the Charles River Dam, for reference. Here's one example of what we're doing. The first floor for the Center for Computing and Data Sciences, which is now under construction, uh, is located 1.25 feet above that elevation of resilience. Moving on to uh, getting to net zero direct emissions, this graph is our greenhouse gas abatement curve. The vertical axis represents emissions, horizontal years. The shades of gray are our fossil fuel emi uh, emissions uh, from various sources. The plan outlines how we will achieve net zero direct emissions by 2040 for our operations. First, we will reduce emissions by 31% by 2032 uh, through energy efficiency. We will source renewable energy to match 100% of the university's electricity usage. We will shift from fossil fuel use to electricity for heating and cooling to enable the transition to renewable energy. And we'll transition the fleet to electric vehicles. So by 2020, the university had reduced its emissions by 40% from our 2006 base year. That is significant and doesn't yet include the BU Wind project. I have to say, we have to attribute a portion of that progress, if you will, to COVID-19 and to a greening grid. So these external factors are, are something we're paying close attention to. Um, so I wanna get back to the Board of Trustees comment about walking the walk. The Climate Action Plan has fundamentally changed how we work and how we develop new projects. The Center for Computing and Data Sciences uh, was initially designed in 2015 but put on hold while another project was being built and the center uh, and the climate action plan was being developed. It would have been a high performance building, I'm sure, and achieved lead gold. But when the design team was reassembled in 2018, after the climate action plan was uh, approved, they were asked to design a fossil fuel free carbon neutral building and design it to, meet, uh, to achieve lead platinum. The center, I think, is a perfect illustration of the strategies for how we're going to get to carbon neutral. If we design this building to meet the very energy efficient standards of the Massachusetts Energy Code, it would still produce nearly 1.4 million kilograms of CO2 equivalent annually. Using strategies to aggressively improve building energy performance, we reduce consumption by about 30%. Using strategies to um, using thermal the thermal mass of the earth for geothermal heating and cooling, we eliminate the need for natural gas. There will be no gas line connected to the building. That is significant, and that allows the building to be fossil fuel free. Switching the energy source from gas to electricity allows us to source that electricity from renewables from BU wind, which allows the project to be carbon neutral. BU Wind came online in December and represents the most impactful single step in achieving the university's goal for carbon neutrality by 2040. According to the US EPA, BU's 205 million kilowatt hour power purchase agreement is the largest active PPA by any college or university in the EPA's Green Power Partnership and puts BU in the top 100 along with Google and Microsoft. The project has 92 wind turbines and is located on 42 square miles of farmland in South Dakota, generating added income to the farmers who lease their land to the project while generating clean power for BU. So why did we choose a project in South Dakota and not in New England? Because we wanted to find a project that would have the greatest impact possible on reducing global greenhouse gas emissions. Since the climate doesn't care where our emissions reductions come from, we chose to find a renewable energy project that would displace the dirtiest electricity generation possible. 
Of the 127 bids we received from proposed projects in the dirtiest grids in the country, this one maximized our criteria and will displace two to three times more emissions than if the same project were located in the greening New England grid. The project is designed to match 100% of the university's electricity use and should reduce our emissions by 53%. The project came online in December and has been generating positive cash flow for the university every month of operation so far. We don't expect that to be the case every month, but it's a good start. Um, for, let me back up here. Uh, the Climate Action Plan recommended that we act on indirect emissions. For how we move, we have focused on the largest source, air travel. A team of students from the Campus Climate Lab have helped us develop recommendations for piloting a travel offset program. For what we buy, acting on the recommendations of, uh, address, to address uh, embodied carbon in building construction, the Center for Computing and Data Sciences has reduced its embodied carbon by more than 13%. For general purchasing, we just launched the Sustainable Purchasing Program. For what we waste, last year we assembled a 54-member task force made up of senior leadership and key stakeholders across eight operational departments, plus faculty and students, to develop a zero waste plan. We released the plan in March and have begin, begun our implementation. The Climate Action Plan recommended we incorporate climate change and sustainability into the undergraduate curriculum. To that end, faculty have been working to develop courses and interdisciplinary collaboration opportunities. As called for in the Climate Action Plan, we launched the Campus Climate Lab last summer as a partnership between BU Research and BU Sustainability. This initiative uses the BU campuses as living laboratories for uh, to advance sustainability practices and the implementation of the Climate Action Plan. The Campus Climate Lab funds students to support their research of their design and increase interdisciplinary collaboration among students, faculty, and staff. Sustainability educational research are now integrated into the university's strategic plan, just released. And uh, I just want to say that to support the implementation of the Climate Action Plan, we have organized our, our uh, operational units, we have uh, standardized practices within units, and we have developed collaborative frameworks across units. Let me close by saying, as you will hear from, hear from Julie and from Heather, um, that if we rapidly reduce our, emission, our impacts on a changing climate, we can help limit the adverse effects from climate change that disproportionately impact environmental justice communities locally and around the world. Sustainability is not about the environment. It is about people and it is about human health. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dennis. We are now moving on to Julie Newman from MIT. Great, can you hear me? Good? Indeed. Excellent, all right. Well, first of all, I wanna say thank you for uh, including us today. And thanks to all of you online for joining us today. I'm sorry that we're still virtual and I hope I get to see people in person soon. I love seeing your photos, Dennis, of uh, people actually interacting in person. Um, I also wanna just say thank you for Dennis. I, you know, I think so much of this work is so, I'm so always so inspired by my colleagues and so, I do feel like Dennis and I've joked over the years of like, as each of us are presenting of, you know, and Heather too, of just taking images of what we're each doing. So I can't wait for the discussion also to follow up with you already. So thank you for sharing all of that. Um, and I know there's so much more behind those, behind those 10 minutes and same for what's to come from Heather. So I want to start off by, I'm going to give a very similar to Dennis, a very brief overview with some insight into uh, our most recent climate action plan. It's called Fast Forward MIT Climate Action Plan for the Decade. And uh, we'll put that in the chat for you so that you have a link to it. Um, this is MIT's second climate action plan. We're on a five-year cycle. And both plans, similar to BU, uh, were informed and established by following a year long, in the case of uh, the second one, even more than a year, uh, community input and debate process and reflective of the most up-to-date climate science 
Our first community input process took place in 2014, and our second one took place uh, beginning in the fall of 2019, and then we extended it virtually through through 2021. And we had over uh, over 20 um, 20 events uh, in that period of time, uh, engaging every all all aspects of the community from operations to to student staff researchers and uh, and faculty, of course. So I wanna begin here. I wanna begin by letting you know that MIT is boldly committed to meeting the world's climate challenge. And we've committed to going as far as we can, as fast as we can, to invest in, invent, and develop a new suite of tools to educate and empower the next generation and to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050, which I'll get into momentarily. But our, our goal is not only for the campus, but for the world. And it's to mobilize the entire community and so with this to commitment to go as far as we can, as fast as we can, we've mobilized our community of experts to combat climate change in the world, and as I said, on campus. But the second point, which is different from our, the, one of the major differences from our first climate action plan to this one, not only is it more ambitious, but it's, we've now created a governance structure that's been set up to ensure the successful implementation and broad community engagement of the plan. And so I know this is a lot to take in, but the purposes of the, the purpose of the slide is to share with you for the per, particularly for the audience here that we've uh, that this was a key shift that we had to make from our lessons learned and uh, hence I think um, it hence a commitment to a five-year opportunity to, to update every five years as opposed to waiting longer because it really gave us a time to, to test out our approaches mobilize community and figure out how we can do more. So without getting into the details, this just shares with you that we have a steering committee with executive level members. We have a climate nucleus that I sit in, which is a faculty base with um, directors of various programs. Um, and we're charged to unify and coordinate across the campus. And that was one of the big takeaways from our year long effort. It was, of course, we have to follow climate science. Of course, we need to accelerate. But one of the biggest excitements that we're the most enthusiastic is we have to unify and we have to coordinate across systems. And so the areas of action in the plan that we just sent you a link to is to you know manage, oversee, reduce MIT's climate impact. That's what I'm overseeing with uh, Vice President of Campus Stewardship and Ser Campus Services and Stewardship, Joe Higgins. But then there's another group focusing on innovation, another one focusing on educating future generations, and another one on leveraging government action and policy. And then we're also charged to work across these. So just wanted to share the kind of the pull the curtain back on how everyone is being mobilized. You know, for the sake of today, I will familiarize you with how we have been tasked and prepared to organize our campus response. Um, we have 14 campus commitments that we're responsible for implementing between now and 2026. Uh, we've organized these commitments for the sake of communication and just in terms of organizing and allocating resources around, uh, as on the far left, the four primary commitments, uh, uh, the four primary organizing principles around uh, net zero by 2026, which I'll get into in more detail, net zero, excuse me, zero direct emissions by 2050, ensuring that we're preparing for a changing climate around resiliency and adaptation, and of course, leveraging the campus um, as a test bed. So that's, that's how the commitments are organized. And then um, I'm gonna send you another link that will come through, which actually outlines all of the 14 commitments that, are now, um, that we're now overseeing. And they range from a resiliency and adaptation to rooftop solar, to uh, deep investments in EV infrastructure from the fleet to charging, to similar to BU, to expanding our portfolio, including scope three emissions and additional offsite areas. So we can get into that further in the discussion as needed. But the sum of these parts, the takeaway here is the sum of the parts is to really drive towards our net zero by 2026 and zero direct emissions by 2050 and a climate resilient campus. So we've now activated each of the work streams I just shared with you to ensure that we have a full comprehensive understanding as to who and what will be needed. And also, of course, the resources available. We're at budget time right now. 12 of the work streams are activated, though only two have a 2022 deadline in an effort to ensure a full comprehensive understanding of who, what, and uh, how much will be needed to succeed. And uh, that's up and running now. 
So as I mentioned, we have two ambitious climate goals. One has committed us to net zero by 2026, a very deliberate effort to also align us with our friends at Harvard. Um, and the other is zero direct emissions by 2050. The 2026 goal, as you will see here, of our baseline is 2014 in our first commitment in our first climate action plan, we were committed to a 32% reduction by 2030 below our 2014 baseline. So again, you can get jumbled with all this. And our uh, with the second climate action plan, the desire was to accelerate that. How do we get further faster given the state of the world? Uh, we've been, we, uh, we have a public accounting structure for our greenhouse gas emissions through um, for MIT community members. So the 2026 goal is, you know, uh, accounts for reductions on campus, but really relies similar to BU on a near-term offset program that we're in the midst of developing. Whereas the 2020, the 2050 goal, zero direct emissions, again, very similar to, to BU, calls for major investments in the campus to reduce demand, determine how to provide electricity, heating, cooling of our campus with zero emissions. And I'll get into a couple of examples uh, in, in a moment. Um, and as I said, keep in mind that our work started back in 2014. So again, I think, again, looking for parallels between panelists, none of this is happening just starting, starting today. For those of you at the beginning of your programs on this call, I, I'm a big proponent of, of setting an initial goal in order to start to reset the internal system. So it really took us five years with, the 20, with our initial goal to basically make sure we had the staffing, we built the capacity, we built the understanding, the new structures to then be able to leap into this commitment to zero emissions. So in short, our team is collectively managing a combination of on and offsite strategies in the near and the long term. And as you can see here, similar, except I'm gonna go back to Dennis and learn about his design of how he shared his, uh, all how his components fit together, but very similar strategies. In our case, we actually just enhanced our central utilities plant. So that was coming online now and we gain about 10%. Uh, re despite growth, we actually, uh, it's a much more efficient system. Not only that, for the next 15 to 25 years, um, it will, will be able to produce our steam, chilled water, and all of our electricity at a cleaner rate than the grid. And we're now actually tracking that on a daily basis. And when that crosses over, we know that we're going to need a, a, a new system in place. We're looking at large scale offset renewables. We already have a solar plant down in North Carolina. We've been relying upon for our, our initial power purchase agreement. And of course, efficiency gains, buildings, fuel switching. And again, I'll share a couple of, a couple of those in a moment. So the big takeaway here, and I think again, a parallel places is for scope one and scope two is really understanding that, we're, that we have a both and process in place. We have to reduce emissions globally. Um, we're, so we're working on a both and we're looking at reducing emissions on campus using accounting protocols. But of course, we're also looking at large scale uh, renewables on the grid as well as carbon sequestration opportunities. And, and probably similar to all of you, we're also engaging student, staff, and faculty in that, in that process. So stay tuned on, on that front. We've also, now that we've integrated, we, we now have integrated MIT campus and Sydney uh, Cambridge data to build a map in order to prepare for a changing climate. And so the, the other component of our plan, which is again, about five years in for this, is really planning for, uh, for this new future that's already happening in real time. So we're working closely with the city of Cambridge. We're grateful for their partnership. And as we know, water does not know where the campus starts or ends. And so we're planning, we're able to, this is a, I just wanted to share this snapshot of you on our dashboard. We can actually look out and now work with our, with our teams across campus to understand the potential impacts of a 10 year storm, a hundred year storm. Uh, we actually have another one looking out to 2070 and we're collecting this data in real time with our researchers. So it's an excellent example of campus as a test bed. I will add here just really quickly, we've also just managed a porosity study and that was quite timely at post IDA because we've been actually working with our researchers to use a citizen science project to actually identify the porosity across campus to understand the implications on subsurface uh, research and, and apartments. 
Um, again, similar to BU, we've been collecting scope three data actually since 2015. We're now prepared to account for scope three and we'll be developing a carbon offset travel program um, as well. So I think what's interesting with this new commitment is we get to ask this question is what will the new normal be? So this is just sharing an example of what our, our uh, tr of the, that which we could account for our travel data from 2019, the aggregate, and then looking into 2020. And we, we're just summarizing 2021 now. So really interesting opportunity to rethink travel and the opportunity. So in short on this front, um, you know, the big piece here for me that's new is the fact that we're mobilizing a campus, we're building capacity across the system. We have 14 commitments. We've enlisted 17 team leads that I'm helping manage um, for, those, for those commitments. We've uh, enlisted about 30 faculty and researchers, more are starting to invite themselves in via a variety of uh, projects, but also I, uh, we have a formal uh, faculty review committee that's that's advising us. And we have about 75 people strewn across all of these teams. And these are all activated at once. So as somebody who's been in the field for a while, this is the first time I've seen this level of capacity be enabled at one time. So that might be an interesting place for discussion um, amongst us. So quickly, just to, um, just to share some specifics for the more technical folks in, in the audience is that the goal of eliminating direct emissions by 2050, as we all know, we have to start now. So we've got, uh, we're looking at deep energy reduction, as I mentioned, leading edge new uh, design and new buildings. We hope to learn from, from BU and, and Harvard and others, converting campus distribution systems, some on-campus renewable, we're looking to double that, electrification of transportation, as I mentioned, and buildings, some AI, enabled energy systems, of course, behavior change, working closely with our, with our labs and looking at uh, scenario planning for breakthrough technology. And I'll just share a couple of visuals with you for those of you familiar with the campus. So we've got a new dorm and we, uh, our gold, lead gold certification is our base, of course, within Cambridge and like many others striving for platinum and beyond in other areas. We've got deep energy retrofits and actually these are some of our highest energy use buildings. This is brain and cog here. Uh, as we mentioned, looking at upgrades of the CUP and lowering our emissions and it's a flexible energy system anticipating uh, future innovations, which is uh, very exciting. If you're on campus or for those of you who live near Kendall Square, you'll see our, because uh, I know some of you online do, you'll see our steam system. They're converting our legacy steam system to medium temperature hot water. So if you're, if you're happen to be biking or scooting past that, that's what you're seeing. Um, we're four years into our first power purchase agreement out of Summit Farms and continuing to learn, learn from that. Also just really grappling with how to account for that. We're not doing this in place of reducing on campus, but similar to Dennis, understanding what's our contribution and where do we reduce the world. Uh, increasing uh, solar on campus, and we've already, already activated that. We're looking at uh, more than doubling our solar. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, looking at electric vehicles. These are really minimum commitments that are outlined here. Um, so we're working on, I uh, will have a team of four students working full time in January as part of MIT's IAP, and they'll be providing the research and, uh, and interesting work to help inform the best way to think about this as the market shifts and also understanding the implications of the new infrastructure bill that we ought to better understand. And the last piece I just want to end with for potential discussion with with Amy and others is at least in my in my tenure in this, you know, in this field, this is the first time I've seen this alignment. I've been working and thinking across scales for many, many years. I, you know, with respect to how we work with cities, with states, uh, nationally, federally, with the globe. And this is the first time I've really seen us align. With, the, with respect to 2050, with a 2050 commitment across the board. And I think this is a real interesting opportunity to think about vertical integration with technology, funds, uh, systems, uh, solutions, and understanding what do we actually have to solve for on campus and where are we pay attention to what's happening at the state, at the grid, et cetera. So really interesting opportunity and unique time, I think, for higher education and our skill set to consider this, this framework. So with that said, there's no perfect audience to open this up and I can't wait to learn from you. Um, Amy, thank you for your time and uh, I'll pass it on. 
Great, thank you so much, Julie. You um, stimulated many, many questions pouring in here. So uh, thank you. Uh, technical uh, questions go to Dennis, technical questions. Uh, okay, I'll remember that, thanks. Um, and now let's let's hear from, um, from Heather Henriksen from Harvard. Hi, Amy, hi everyone. Uh, great to be with you. Uh, I echo what Julie said that um, it's just really exciting. Um, to, to join forces and been working with these guys um, for many, many years. Let's just see, how's that? There we go. Um, so we're trying to be uh, collaborative as we are and also share different um, approaches. So we focus a lot on the Harvard team on explaining um, our sort of organizational change and, and how we work. So I'll just start with saying that we think of Harvard as sort of a mid-sized city um, and analogous to large multinational companies. Um, we're a little unique for higher ed in just how decentralized we are with our 12 schools and multiple very large groups like real estate and housing operating independently, their own P&Ls. Um, and that sort of decentralization structure, we think helps us partner um, both with higher ed, but also the private sector and the cities to really sort of use the campus as this test bed, just the size also of 20 million, um, 25 million square feet. It's about double Yale as an example uh, to where Julie came from. Uh, and we also have uh, now three district energy systems, um, one low temperature hot water, uh, one steam and, and third steam that is also not under our control, so uh, controlled by a private entity. So again, just sort of, uh, we think a great test bed. We have a presidential committee on sustainability that our president Larry Backow put together two years ago that my team manages. Um, and this is really helping oversee everything that we're doing related to sustainable development. Um, and it's been very exciting to work uh, with senior faculty, students, um, and administrators. This is a continued strategy for us since 2008 of really leveraging our, our stakeholders. But I think President Backow is really raise the level um, and also has just appointed a new vice provost for climate change and sustainability that our office and this presidential committee are working very closely with um, related to research and teaching. So I'm gonna, everything that we're doing is under the guise and umbrella of this advisory group. Um, and so I will walk through in a little bit more detail what we're doing here. Um, I also would just say that I think one of the unique things our office does a little different for higher ed is just not only living lab like we've all talked about, which is I think our approach and, and rightfully so leveraging our faculty and our students and the ideas, um, but we also drive the strategy and organizational change across the, the 12 schools and the units, as I said. We work with the faculty um, and staff to set goals and then to implement these goals and make sure there's alignment um, across these multiple stakeholders involving hundreds and hundreds of people. And then I think we are really advancing our work with these strategic partnerships. Again, not just in higher ed in the cities, but also increasingly in the private sector um, with Google and Microsoft and others. So these are just a bunch of groups that our team also manages um, that I think helps create that alignment. Again, faculty, student, and uh, staff organizations. This is our sort of sustainable development vision. This is our, our, our playbook. We start with the faculty. We create a holistic vision and a plan, which we've had since 2014. We again, tap into um, our, our living lab from policy and research and a number of areas. And then we really just pilot proving and scaling. And again, agree with others that we're trying to do this, not just, you know, Harvard just a test bed to try to help locally regionally uh, and globally find these solutions with our faculty. So how we've done a lot of this, again, because we have such a large diffused organization is to codify it in visions, priorities, principles, and goals. And our first sustainability plan was approved in 2014. We're currently working on a 2030 action agenda for sustainable development. We spent the last year with faculty framing this out. Um, and now we are putting it through the paces um, with our facilities and operations and organizational staff. So look forward to that uh, coming soon. 
We also have a climate action plan. Um, we are, our first one was delivered in 2016, an absolute cut in emissions 30% um, in effectively about seven years. And now we have fossil fuel free by 2050 and fossil fuel neutral by 2026 goals that we set in February of 2018. And I'm going to talk through a little bit about where we are on that. We also, as I mentioned, have these other holistic university-wide sustainability standards that really help us make sure there's continuity um, because our schools pick their own vendors for all of these various services. Many of them, again, are the same people that Google and Microsoft and Salesforce and others use. And so we think that's a great opportunity for us to hopefully be pushing. You know, we only serve 10 million meals a year here, but we work with restaurant associates that's part of Compass Groups and they serve 10 million meals a day. So our standards hopefully are, we know are impacting them. So the other is just, this is how we think about Living Lab, both research that we're doing with our faculty, for instance, on those standards and the implementation on policies, again, our goals and standards that we're creating, coursework like our Climate Change Living Lab Solutions Group, a uh, course that's been going on a multidisciplinary six schools course that's been happening for the last five, six years, and then just collaboration. These are some of our partners in sustainable development, of course, the Boston Green Ribbon Commission, up there at the top um, with, with our friends, Dennis and Julie, as a huge part of that. Uh, we also have increasingly in the last six years or so been working with private sector companies um, on a lot of our pilots, just because we're set up like them. And so there's been a lot of learnings across there. And just to spend a second, you know, why are our goals fossil fuel free and not carbon free? Our faculty felt, felt it was very important to focus on the to total, the holistic damages that our fossil fuel choices are causing. They feel that carbon is too restrictive and it also leaves out very immediate uh, impacts, not just 2050, but today on health and air pollution. So we're working with them to actually quantify the impacts of our fossil fuel choices on health and air pollution. And we hope over time to also be able to quantify them in water, uh, for instance, and other pollutants. This is our roadmap for 2026, um, you know, to zero out our not only our greenhouse gas, but also our health impacts from the health from the air pollution. We are focused on 100% new renewable energy, re new renewable electricity. Um, and again, targeting and, and quantifying benefits, both on health and equity, um, and, and sharing those results and doing post hoc evaluations with our faculty. Are we having the intended impact we hope? or not, and if not, we will change what we're purchasing. We know that where we buy in the United States um, actually impacts the profile of the health inequity. And so that's why these are top considerations for us in addition to additionality of making sure that we're having a, um, you know, a new and, and quantifiable uh, difference. This is our pathways and our planning for 2050. So you can see where um, our uh, emissions break down, um, our district systems, purchase electricity, also some, some individual building heating systems, and then the impact of our um, owned and operated vehicles. So we already are working right now on a scoping study for our district energy, sort of the plan to get the plan to get to zero. Uh, I've talked about our purchase electricity strategy on renewables. And then we are also through our green building standards and other ways, um, looking at emissions and planning for the schools. And I'll talk about our vehicles in a second. So this is why we're so focused on buildings, because for us, our scope one and two emissions are so focused on the buildings. And that's why our strategy, again, on climate, health, and equity has been so focused on the buildings. Um, and of course, um, that you can see why. Also, we are working right now with our faculty to not only drive down scope free emissions through numerous pilots, um, but also to set goals in this arena um, and really control our supply chain. And just three examples of what we're working on today um, are driving down emissions in our food system. We're part of the Cool Food Pledge with the UN. Um, and we also are working on a carbon charge um, analysis across the schools, also in partnership with others in higher ed. 
Um, and we're also looking into body carbon because we feel we can have an outsized impact here. Most people are addressing a body carbon and getting those 20% cuts through buying um, you know, cement and other products that are using fly ash um, and other substitutes really, which are toxic byproducts, again, of the fossil fuel system and burning coal. Um, and our faculty say that these are toxic, unknown um, products that we're then putting into building materials and into our buildings. And is this what we really want? So we're studying that right now holistically. We're also, you know, in partnership with, with the city and Boston Green River Commission uh, doing resiliency planning for not only buildings, but across the campus. As I said, on scope three, we're really looking at sort of a circular economy approach to our built environment. Because uh, we think buildings are more than just, of course, energy and emissions, and they have to be addressing health and equity and circularity. Why? Because this is another global systemic challenge that at its heart is about climate equity and environmental justice. And this is the fact that there are toxic chemicals in basically everything we buy and no, there's a failed regulatory system where only nine chemicals out of the 80,000 have any federal regulation and asbestos is not one of them. So this is another global systemic challenge that our faculty want us and we have been working hard to address um, for many years now. Um, again, because the procurement of our goods and services is not just climate, but needs to be health and equity. There are real health impacts of these things that we are procuring and we can have an outsized impact in transforming the marketplace, not only for climate, but for health and equity. We have a Harvard Healthier Building Academy that we founded with our faculty from three graduate schools in 2016 that has actually been doing this in our capital projects, um, requiring material transparency, targeting classes of chemicals like PFAS and chemical flame retardants, evaluating products against third-party standards, and really driving the marketplace for healthier products along with others in the private sector like Google and Kaiser Permanente. And then institutionalizing these into standards that we hope others will take and run with and help us improve. This is our scorecard since 2016. Um, we basically have done 41 capital projects representing 3 million square feet. We've worked with um, over 1,300 manufacturers, researched more than 10,000 products, and have now worked to have better standards for interior products, getting these toxic classes of chemicals out over 20 product types in our buildings. This is an example of how we did it with the Harvard Science and Engineering Complex. Um, not only lead platinum on climate and other areas, but again, health and equity with, our, with the largest living building challenge materials pedal certification. So just to sum up here, you know, again, this is another example of how we're looking at embodied and operational carbon and health together. We also are, as I mentioned, addressing our owned vehicles. We now uh, put in a third of our electric buses, 100% electric and are piloting owning the infrastructure in the Northeast. Um, so addressing that 1%, but it's 1% for Harvard's emissions, but it's 40% for Massachusetts. So hopefully this will be helpful for others. Again, I've talked about Living Lab and, and Howard. These are pilots we're undergoing right now with faculty across scope three and other areas. Um, and we also, I just wanna end on, you know, we spend a lot of time with our Campus Sustainability Innovation Fund working with students and faculty on pilot projects related to climate health and equity. Here's two recent examples. There's a biofertilizer that started in the Arnold Arboretum and is now growing uh, raspberries and strawberries in your refrigerators. And then Dr. Anna Yan did this project to, to codify for the first time ever, if you act again against these toxic chemicals in the built environment, can we tell? Is there a reduction? And it turns out there's significant reductions in these chemicals that are quantifiable. So I'll just end on that note because I think um, so much of what we all do is to really work with our students and to help them be demonstrating in our faculty real world solutions that can scale. Um, and those are a couple examples. And I think that threads together again, how we are really looking holistically at climate health and equity um, here at Harvard. Thank you, Heather.
That was very rich and um, congratulations on your electric buses. I went there for the ribbon cutting and it was super exciting. <laughs> and um, the mayor of Cambridge was there and a representative of the Massachusetts uh, EEA. So it was, a, um, you know, you're, you're, you're having a big ripple effect. Okay, so we're now going to move into a moderated discussion. I think Claire, you're gonna get us all sort of on a, on the screen, or maybe it's just my view that's not showing it right. Um, there we go. And um, I'm taking questions from the audience. They are pouring in on the chat as well as the Q&A. It would be really helpful to me if you would try to keep them to the chat just because there's only so many tracks my brain can work on at one time. Um, but we've gotten a lot of questions uh, in a few different categories. One is about sort of general governance and leadership. And, uh, and the very impressive organization that you all have um, moved into to, to, get all, to get these complex plans moving forward. Um, and then the, the uh, second one is really about kind of scope three. And the third one is, uh, there are many questions about um, electrification, which is getting much more into the technical weeds. So I thought we could start with the governance and organization questions. And you all um, showed, you know, the various leadership committees requests came from the board to the president, to the committee, and to those. And now you've got multiple departments um, and multiple constituencies, students and um, outside partners and faculty. So I guess the question that I have is, who are you three the ones who manage all this like says who does the school decide to devote so much time and resources across the board to this effort um and uh and and then secondly how you know i guess is the job of the president and the board uh changing is the definition of success for leadership for a major university changing as a result of um, the need to be proactive in climate? And I, I don't really care who starts. Julie, maybe I'll start with you since you had the wonderful slide of the 14, 17, 30, 75, and 8. I forget what they all were, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the leadership front, I think that was our lesson learned. I mean, I, you know, I think we can all have a smirk. We all are, I mean, I, I have a spreadsheet of the amount of committees we're involved. We all are involved with the amount of committees my staff is involved with. So I think we're ex, or I think higher education is expert at decision. I think there's other ways people describe it, you know, decisions by committee, if you will. Um, I think the difference I'm seeing here is, uh, is, is who's is the amount of empowerment and the, uh, there's a new type of mobilization that I'm experiencing, like with that one slide that I shared earlier, where there's not one commitment outlined in the plan that we shared with you, um, or rather, let me say in a, in a positive way, every commitment outlined in the fast forward plan has a point person responsible for overseeing the development execution of that commitment, and so that's that's pretty unique. Um, and that that was a shift from our first plan where, again, it was out there. Um, so the answer is no, it's not just me. I'm, I am responsible with Joe Higgins for that whole and that the slide that I shared with everything campus oriented, but MIT is now mobilized across research, teaching, policy, government engagement, and there's somebody responsible for every single thing outlined. And I think that's really, really important. Now, we also, um, I can't speak to all of the funding because I'm only can, can speak to what's happening on the campus, but we're really working hard to make sure that it's not an unfunded mandate either. So we're working closely of open communication with, you know, with Glenn Shore and the team and really being very deliberate in terms of how we go about achieving these, these pieces. Um, I think to your point, maybe this is what you're after. I think the, the last piece I'll say on this front is I, it does take people and it takes we have we can no longer think about climate and sustainability as something somebody has to do on the side of their job, and that's how it was for a long time. And people would feel, oh, they're taxing me again because 
now I have to do this extra. And I think the big shift I'm seeing is the integration of these responsibilities of cross positions from finance, you know, to all things planning, operations, design, engineering, et cetera. Um, and that, that's, that's one of the big shifts. So it's a really a distributed leadership model with those of us in our roles to make sure we're moving forward, everything's accounted for, we're measuring, we're reporting back, we're seeking the funding. We have to change, you know, course correction. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, really no. Key. So, so just to get really down into it, does that mean that if yeah. I uh, am a, um, you know, a, a, a professor, a professor of English literature, for example, with you know perhaps not a lot apparently to do with climate change, that is now going to be in my job objectives for the year. Uh, some, some kind of. Oh, you had to go there, Amy. You had to go there. I can't, I can't state that. That is not my, my, that is not my responsibility at MIT. On the other hand, with an education, they're exploring, you know, the integration of an opportunity to integrate sustainability across, you know, across the curriculum. So uh, no, uh, we're not there yet. Um, I think the thing, you know, I think, and I can't speak, of course, for BU and Harvard, but what I've observed and learned from and pulled in is that we are making it possible to act, you know, with with respect to how we think about energy, transportation. So I think in the lives that we lead within our institute, one can make sustainability decisions all of the time now, right? In terms of the choices we make, if you will, with respect to how people teach, uh, I can't I can't speak to that at this moment. But of course, there's a movement to uh, to to begin to integrate that across curriculum. Great. Okay. I'm sure you, uh, Heather, Dennis, want to jump in there. I, 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 <laughs> I have to say I'm very impressed with the way Julie has, has organized this and, um, and her team have organized um, all of the, that integration. I will say for Boston University, um, we have integrated a lot from the Climate Action Plan into really at the unit level for what people do. My office is really responsible for facilitating the climate action plan, for being the, the ones who need to go do the extra research to figure out how to get something done. Um, and you know, those are, that's, that, that's how we operate. Um, and honestly, I think we can, we can all do a better job. And I think we're, we're working to do that. Yeah, I'll just say, I mean, I think I touched on this in, in the slides, but I think, you know, we have since 2014 had this sort of holistic, integrated, distributed leadership model, just because that's the way we can get anything done at Harvard. We've got to get alignment across these 12 schools and multiple entities. And so we baked in with our first generation climate goal, these other standards that are operational. But I think the difference that we've seen um, you know, since then and over the last couple of years, and it's it's also what the private sector is seeing, I think everyone's seeing is just, this is now uh, integral, not just to the mission on research and teaching, but it's integral on an operations um, level, right? The, the, um, there has been an elevation of sustainability really that is at the presidential level um, and even beyond our executive vice president, um, you know, and, and I do this in partnership on the campus side with Meredith Wienick. And I think we've seen, you know, sustainability used to be a, a nice to have or added cost to business. And that's fundamentally shifted. And it, it is now integrated in just to the way that we work and live and our entire operations. And then I'd say on the research and teaching side, even in the last two years during COVID, I have seen an unprecedented level of engagement from our faculty, not only you know, with hours and hours, you know, 40 hours per committee uh, working with us, you know, for instance, to define what we mean by fossil fuel free and then what's our approach to buy renewable energy, but really wanting to roll up their sleeves. The students want to engage and do experiential learning. They want to build a company when they're here. They want to grapple with these issues that they're going to grapple with when they go out in the marketplace for jobs. Um, and the faculty really want to get outside of the classroom and, and do this work. So I, I think that's been um, a shift, honestly, that is, that is palpable. I'll so, just add so, those points. So uh, I guess one of the reasons that I'm pushing on this question is that 
there are obviously a lot of people in, in the, on the call today who are trying to figure out how to get this done, probably in a situation where they don't have the resources of, you know, they can fundraise for capital, they have the, you know, intellectual heft of the faculty and the, and, and so they're thinking, okay, well, how do I create that kind of uh, ethos or, you know, culture in my organization? And that would also, it applies to private, it applies also to the city of Boston or in other municipalities I know are on this call, the state and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I'm gonna go way out on a limb here. You don't have to answer this if you <laughs> find it in politic, but suppose you're sitting in the mayor's seat today, you know, and, and uh, mayor of Boston, and you've got uh, an environment department and a few others that are, have been involved because operationally they have to, Boston Water and Sewer, but uh, across the board, not so much of um, sort of a, a, a one city approach to climate um, so far. And I think that's a little bit more analogous to your situation, Heather, perhaps where you've, you've had to corral your 12 schools than maybe um, I would say Julie and Dennis perhaps have more of a, you know, a, a, a top-down, a, top a little bit more top-down capability just because of how their schools are structured. So maybe, Heather? That, that was a long, uh, that was long. What's the actual the question? question? The, Sorry. question is, the question is, what recommendations do you have for cities, Boston or any other city that yeah. is organized along 19th century, 20th century, yeah. you know, departments? and now has to think holistically about climate. Right, well, I, I mean, I think we are very fortunate to be sitting here in, you know, I can speak for Harvard in Boston and, and Cambridge, um, because we have two cities that have been, I think very progressive, have been uh, focused on, you know, making sure the policy aligns with the science. Um, and so I think, you know, they've really gone about this in the right way. Um, you know, all of the goals are aligned, uh, you know, again, with the latest in thinking on science and research. So I think, you know, and I think they've also done a good job to tap in not only to higher ed expertise, but the Boston Green River Commission is a perfect model for this of, you know, leveraging the, the, the private sector, Boston properties and the corporate real estate environment, um, you know, re leveraging the cultural institutions, the hospitals, um, you know, and I think bringing all of that expertise into play has been really beneficial. And I think we'll continue, you know, we're here to advise, um, you know, on how they take the next steps as we take the next steps. You know, um, you know, just as I said, we're looking at beyond scope one and two, which is what these, all these climate goals have really been focused on with scope three. I think that's the next frontier uh, for cities and all of us to, you know, be looking at. Um, I know the cities are already looking at embodied carbon, for instance. So, you know, I think we're here to help and we're really set up well to partner together. And I, I think this is what sets Boston and Cambridge apart is they have this really incredible mix of multi-sector partners to not just set goals out, out there, but to really think through how to do it so that it will, you know, scale and have the intended impact. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about the next step. Okay, good. Well, thank you. Um, so I want to shift gears here and get a little more technical. We have had an avalanche of questions about electrification of large bu buildings. Um, and uh, starting with, uh, you know, how much does it cost? And, um, you know, what, uh, let's see, associated with electric, uh, demand, uh, electrifying thermal demand um, and eliminating natural gas, which you touched on, Dennis, uh, and central electrification. How do you get off of the gas-fired uh, district energy? Is anyone looking at um, district geothermal? Let, let me and have you me, have you considered buying offshore wind? I think I squeezed in a lot of questions there, but you can tackle let, it wherever let, you like. Let, let me start. Um, I, I think if we um, just look at the example, well, let me start by saying uh, decarbonizing heating and cooling for existing buildings is a high hurdle. Okay, that's that's going to be a challenge. 
Um, so we're starting with, with new construction. Um, so the Center for Computing and Data Sciences, as I mentioned, um, is not connected to a gas line. It will not be. Um, but we, we've also looked at how to maximize um, the efficiency of the whole system um, so that we um, are not, um, we're not relying on the geothermal system, the ground source heat pump, completely for 100% of the heating and cooling. It accommodates about 90% of that. We have an electric boiler to get the peak periods because getting to that peak is really expensive if you're using that, that ground source heat, heat pump system. Um, and that's the way we're looking at doing this on, on other projects. We have, uh, through the Campus Climate Lab, a uh, team of students and faculty who have been looking at how to decarbonize the Charles River campus uh, for heating and cooling and, and have really come to the same conclusion that you, you really need to look at um, using that ground source or air source as, a, um, as the majority of, of that load, but not, not getting to that last, that last 10% and doing that um, in our case with electric um, boilers. Um, so the, the cost issue is, is an important one because if we look at the Center for Computing and Data Sciences and we've done the analysis, um, it, it was more expensive to do that, but it was only about 1%, it was actually less than 1% more to do that system. When you look at it holistically from how we would have done that project without, um, without the high efficiency system and the ground source heat pump. So that, that analysis is, is important. Um, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Great, Julie, did you wanna add something there? I mean, I just wanna say these are great questions and I think this is where the role of the Green Ribbon Commission comes in is this ongoing exchange of, of what we're learning on our campuses. Um, I mean, the questions are spot on and yes, this is what we're all looking at in real time. So I just wanna second a very similar approach to, you know, to, to what Dennis said. I do wanna put a plug in for our good friend at Princeton who is actually in the midst of, I believe installing or, or pretty close to a, in, you know, to a GMO centralized geothermal system. You know, so that would be one I think to look at. Um, but it doesn't, I think the challenge we're all facing is can that be applied in this, in this dense urban environment? And uh, it, you know, it's not, you know, we get a lot of pushback of, you know, this is what Stanford did, or this is what Princeton's doing. You should go ahead and apply it. And when we start to look at it, it's not, it's not so simple. So, you know, again, this is where the open exchange of ideas comes from. And I think your questions are great. I think in terms of offshore wind, yes, of course, we're, we're looking at that also um, as part of our um, future power purchase agreement. We're certainly looking at geothermal. I mean, we're looking at new technologies. And our goal, as I mentioned, is we're constantly studying the carbon intensity of our power plant to bet, you know, to continue to understand where, where it is we're going to have to really shift over. So we see that as a bridge to keep everything stable, to keep our research going, our buildings heated and cooled. Um, but it's, it's literally looked at daily to try to figure out how to wean ourselves off of, off of natural gas. We're not waiting until... 2035. It's, it's right. We understand we have to plan and start doing that today as we understand what the opportunities are. The last thing I'll say is the vertical integration part's really interesting. I mean, that's the piece. And I guess that was the municipal piece I wanted to say is that we all play very different roles. So I just want to add two more things is one is understanding, you know, zoning and, you know, uh, opportunities that come out of the municipality. In the case of us, it's Cambridge. With respect to these questions, we're really watching the grid carefully and what how Massachusetts will be investing in the grid. So we we can actually eventually electrify through the grid, but notwithstanding heating and cooling. But we don't have to, we can we can bring power in from the grid and, and unplug ourselves from that for electricity, but we're not there yet at the grid. Right. So yeah. Um, I know an, another angle on approaching this, Heather, in your new science building over in Alston, there's a there's a sort of a, a on location power plant, if, if that's that, those, that's my word, it's probably not technically correct, but and it's and it's designed to be adaptable in the future. 
Yeah, so that's our, um, again, we have two district energy systems, one that we inherited and um, or we, we purchased many years ago and have done uh, tremendous upgrades to in, in addition, you know, adding new boilers, cogeneration, but it's still a steam plant. Um, and so that's the one that I was mentioning in particular, we're looking at very closely now to sort of understand what technologies exist today, what are going to be the technologies you know, to understand, you know, just like Julie said, we're not waiting till 2040, 2035 to think about our district systems. We're thinking about them right now. The one in Alston, um, you know, we made very different decisions uh, building a new uh, district system. Uh, it is a low temperature hot water system, which is much more efficient than steam. Um, it is designed to be flexible in the sense that it could take either non-fossil fuel sources in the future, um, should those be, you know, uh, up to, you know, again, Julie, we're talking about scale. You know, would they be at a scale for a 550,000 square foot lab building and other buildings that will connect to it, um, or to be electrified, for instance, or other technologies? So it's flexible, and it also has the largest thermal storage system in Massachusetts, or at least at the time it was built. Um, so again, trying to be very wise about when we generate energy, store it, you know, when it's the lowest carbon, generate the energy, store it, and then use it when it's at that sort of, when the grid's at the peak of, um, of carbon intensity. So that's a newer system. It's currently just now servicing that science and engineering complex building. But again, it is set over there to help all of Harvard's institutional projects um, to grow. Because we know, I mean, you know, when Harvard did our first climate goal, the 30% absolute cut in emissions, a third of our reduction came from changes that we made at our district energy system. And so we know how efficient these district energy systems can be because you make changes in one place that have ripple effects across the district. And will that system uh, serve non-Harvard um, facilities in the neighborhood as well, Heather? Uh, at this time, it is, uh, you know, it is sanctioned for in, uh, institutional projects. So okay. Um, so a quick technical question about ge back to district geothermal. Is it possible to go vertically, Dennis, rather than horizontally and thus? Well, yeah. I mean, that's essentially what we've done. We've, we have, for the Center for Computing and Data Sciences, we have 31 1500 foot deep boreholes. For reference, that is twice as deep as the John Hancock building is high. So, and we have, we have the technology to do this in New England, although the technology is not as advanced as it is in some other parts of the country. And if we have more, uh, more organizations doing this, the demand for better technology to come into the region um, will be an important transition to actually move everybody forward here. Another piece on that, just to, to touch on the complexity of a, an urban environment, um, you know, we went, like I said, 1500 feet, and um, that's more difficult once you get past 500 feet. So that's where that technology piece comes in. But um, one thing, because there's so little land area in an urban environment to do this, we, we actually used an alleyway and a little bit of a pocket park to, to uh, deploy that. Uh, Boston Architectural College actually worked with the city of Boston to, to drill their boreholes um, in a public alleyway. And I think that public-private partnership is an important element of this and important for us to unlock to, to be able to move this forward. Well, I think there's going to be a lot more of that kind of questioning and probing as how we as to how we get this done with the pending zone uh, net zero carbon zoning for new buildings. We're going to have to figure this out. So you know that's something that's driving all of us, not not just these not just the higher ed institutions. A um, couple more questions on the technicalities of energy, and then I want to move into scope three because we have a lot of questions there too. Um, wind, how are you all thinking about, uh, are you considering buying into the offshore wind projects planned in Massachusetts, off the coast of Massachusetts? I'll start. 
Um, at the moment, we have uh, a match for 100% of our electricity use um, through the, the BU Wind Project in South Dakota. Uh, we don't, for 15 years or now 14 years, uh, aren't going to need to revisit that, uh, but we certainly will have to revisit that depending upon how green the grid is uh, 14 years from now. Um, so certainly that might be part of the considerations but that's that's a decision we're going to need to be making further out anything on your side julie um as i mentioned for our 2026 you know starting commitment we're exploring all sorts of options that that are out there um now i would say at this point nothing's off the table that's probably the best way to say it and there's a, a lot of a uh, lot of people looking at this that cut across faculty to research. So stay tuned over the next year or so as we understand what our options are. Okay, while you have the floor, um, a, a couple of people heard you talk about carbon sequestration mm -hmm. and would love to know sort of the state of the art on carbon sequestration, what's being explored um, from a, you know, that MIT may be on the cutting edge of and does it fit into your plan at all? Yeah, again, Everything's on the table right now. I mean, we have these renowned researchers working on everything from renewable fuels to, uh, you know, again, uh, to nuclear batteries, right, to storage, to sequestration. And I think similar to both of my good friends and peers here, we're deeply engaged with our faculty to, you know, basically have these really intense discussions. Everyone is trying to accelerate and we, you know, how to reduce emissions and how to wean ourselves off of fossil fuel. So um, I'm not here to, you know, to support a specific technology or to, you know, to, to recommend one as much as just letting you know, it's literally, it's all hands on deck right now. We're all mobilized to figure this out both for the world and at the campus level, both as individual institutes and also together. Many of our faculty work across BU and and Harvard too. So I know that's probably not the answer people are looking for. I'm just alluding to, I'm just letting you know that we are thinking about everything from renewable energy to, to storage, to sequestration over between now and 2050. Um, so we understand at what point we, you know, we either invest or engage along the way. So it's, I guess the, the conclusion here is that it's a new conversation and it's gonna take a portfolio, a portfolio approach over time. Um, but we can certainly send some links or some amazing people, I'm sure working at all of our institutions. I just know of the ones, some of the folks within um, MIT, I'm sure we can send links to the Green Ribbon Commission to research that's coming out of our MIT Energy Initiative that are deeply studying this. Well, I'm sure that would be appreciated because there there's just a lot of technical questions coming from all directions from the audience here today. So they're hungry, yeah. clear hunger Maybe for that would technical information. Yeah, I mean, that could be a future panel with some, some you know, that we could recommend some colleagues to come and join you for some very specific uh, green yeah. ribbon discussions around sequestration to, to new technologies. And if technologies. anyone has checked out the, the, the plant in Iceland, that is, um, it's, it's it hasn't been scaled up, but you know what I'm talking about, the, the, the one that's turning the, that's producing a sort of a lava-like rock out of uh, pulling carbon out of the air. It's, um, it's the most encouraging thing I'd seen recently. That, that was just, you can find it by Googling it in the news. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about scope three. And then I'd like to end by sort of thinking about your, how these plans imply broader relationships externally outside of the, outside of academia or outside of your schools. Um, okay, how uh, a lot of questions about plastic. What is your plan for eliminating plastics on campus? And a really interesting one, has any of your institutions made a commitment to eliminating synthetic fields? So maybe um, Heather, I'll ask you to start on this one. Yeah, so, uh, you know, a couple of things I would just say, and I just want to comment on the last piece about sequestration and say, obviously we have faculty too that are studying all kinds of, um, you know, sequestration and even uh, technologies beyond that um, to, to eliminate in emissions from the atmosphere. So I think we can definitely, um, like Julie, all of us can put some great resources out there. I just would also say that this is now, um, you know, the private sector, I think is leading on this. 
but it's no longer acceptable, for instance, for companies to just be offsetting emissions. They're really looking at carbon sequestration and, and doubling down and investing in um, not just projects, but you know, of course you saw Microsoft um, in, investing a billion dollars in studying carbon sequestration. So I, this is definitely um, an in, you know, enormous focus as we move forward, I think like scope three. Um, and I think that you know, the thing about sequestration is we can't just continue to burn the fossil fuels and then sequester <laughs> the carbon. We really need, you know, because we're also not capturing the air pollution there. We really need to stop using fossil fuels. That's the, that's what we need to do as quickly as possible. Um, and then scope three, of course, you know, again, our supply chains and our procurement have such enormous um, both impacts and also I think opportunity because we have great purchasing power to sort of be addressing scope three. Um, and so, you know, that's again, where we have been trying to focus again on what we're buying so, but again, looking at it holistically, what we're buying from a climate perspective with a health perspective and an equity perspective, looking at all lenses together. And I think when you look at it holistically, you also don't have these sort of unintended consequences later where maybe you did something that seemed good for carbon, but actually was bad for health. Um, and then the other thing I would just say related to plastics, we are working on plastic, um, at Kennedy School in particular, is doing some very innovative research that we're partnering with them on to drive down um, the, just the, the creation of plastic that's coming to their campus, not just the recycling and reuse of it. Um, and so we're really looking at, at that um, angle. And at its core, again, fossil fuels are plastics. They are, the, they are the energy, of course, but they're also these toxic chemicals that we've been trying to address, these SVOCs, not the VOCs. Like, chemical flame retardants and PFAS chemicals, they're all the same. So really the issue across the board is addressing fossil fuels and leaving them in the ground. Do either of you wanna jump in on plastics let, or let, any let, other- Let, let me jump in on the plastics thing. Um, certainly it's a, it's a big issue and as fossil fuel industries are seeing the, the need for fossil fuels declining, particularly in the transportation sector, they're moving into um, plastics uh, more and more. Um, we did a, actually Michael Walsh, who I think is on, on this uh, Zoom yeah, today, um, he, for, for BU, did an analysis of our, the emissions associated with our waste stream. 18% of our waste is plastic waste it contributes 87% of the emissions associated with our waste stream. So it's really, I mean, if you just look at the difference in scales there, it's a, it's a major area that we need to be focused on in figuring out how to, how to keep that off of campus to begin with. Um, so, and we're working, we're working um, for, so we're looking for solutions. And I think one important solution is the well the single use um, drink if if or water in particular, if um, if we can avoid making those purchases to begin with, that's job one. But if if we do need that that bottle of water, um, aluminum is another solution, and aluminum is eminently recyclable. Um, it takes more energy to produce initially, but it um, it can be recycled many 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 times. So. It's those kinds of systemic thinking we need to be moving toward. Okay, so that's an interesting transition to the final area I'd like to talk about, and that is sort of the use, uh, using your voices, your influence externally. I know all of your plans involve partnerships with the private sector. They have, uh, Julie, you have a, a, a policy, a whole policy section. These, this is a level of looking outward and seeking to influence that I think is, might not have been there in your, in your plans, you know, your previous iterations of your plans. And um, plastics, for example, so you're there trying to fend off individual plastics from coming to your campus and really the root of the problem is the plastics are being manufactured you know 
and, and, and basically they're so convenient, it's hard to avoid them, they're multi-layered, they're different kinds of plot. So why is there not more sort of external policy focus coming from you, these leading organizations with these amazing profiles, like public cry for a carbon tax, public cry for you know packaging reform, that sort of thing. And maybe there is, but I just sort of, when, when do we get to that point? And I'm goading you because we've talked about all this before. So, <laughs> I mean, I can just say on, on our end, <clears throat> as you can see, this is, I can't speak to exactly everything that's coming out of it, but there is a deep engagement now and commitment to policy engagement, um, you know, from the, uh, you know, we certainly all work pol at the policy level. I mean, Heather and I sit on a net zero commission. We all, cert you know, certainly, Dennis is deeply involved with with Boston, you know, at the local level. I feel like that's our role, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of working deeply with Cambridge, with Boston, and so I would say that is policy engagement at that at that front. Um, there, I, again, I do, I can't speak to the details. I do suggest it would be a really great future Green Ribbon Commission with the folks who are doing this. But we're, um, I think we all, I can at MIT, we have a Washington office, and that office is deeply engaged with driving climate, you know, climate policy at that at that level. And of course, you know, on our end, Maria Zuber sits on the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and um, they're really building up the recognition of how we need to work at that level. So I'm not sure it's a goading thing as much as it's happening. And I just need, and I think we all recognize that partnerships and private, you know, we just announced a new MIT Climate Sustainability uh, Consortium, which is uh, private sector partnerships with many familiar organizations that was just launched by a good friend of mine's a colleague is the director of that. Um, and so it's building new partnerships for sustainability and climate solutions, you know, at scale. So there are so many institutes and groups working on these issues across where well, you're just getting a snippet today. So please recognize that we're, we're a snippet of the iceberg of how much is happening at our institutions. And should there be more interest, I think it could be a again, a future list we put together of what's happening and how to weave that into dialogue. But we go have, ahead, Heather. In. Yeah, thank, thank you for saying that. I'm gonna let, you, I'm gonna have to stop it there given the time. I apologize to um, Heather and Dennis who I sure wanted to answer that question. And I do think we should reconvene. I can't tell you the avalanche of interest that I, I've only touched on 10% of the questions that came in over the chat. So. Um, I think that's that that's a real testament to testimony to uh, these wonderful presentations and the interest that you fostered. And I would say, let's do it again. Um, let's follow it up very soon. I do want to mention, thank you all for coming. We have a couple of upcoming GRCX programs um, early next year, one on climate action planning for institutions. So if you are impressed by what you heard here, the GRC is offering a climate action planning um, program. And we've put our first group of institutions through it and they are going to, um, we're gonna sort of report out on how that's going midstream. And um, secondly, residential real estate climate risk with Dave Burt from Delta Terra back by uh, popular demand. This is a, a un, unsecured risk, um, across the state and nationally and that and he's always very interesting to listen to thank you so much for coming i really appreciate it thank you to all three of our panelists julie heather and dennis i'm sorry that we couldn't get to every single question and answer goodbye for now thanks everyone <laughs>